I'm just, um, I'm excited. It's, you know, it's that time of year. It's Christmas. It's that season. And it is, it is exciting. It is an exciting season. Uh, not because of the pageantry, not because of the consumerism, although that's what makes it exciting in many ways. I know that. I get that we live in a society that, as a little kid, we're, we're taught and trained and geared and molded into thinking Christmas is good because of the stuff. Now, that's a very, that's a very human way to think. A stuff equals happiness, right? And so uh, Christmas has kind of gotten that uh, consumer commercialism to it. And that's, you know, you know, that's not the greatest thing. That's not really what it is. We know that. But it does lend to an excitement, and it does lend to people that don't ordinarily come to church coming to church. So I'm praying that this season will be an opportunity for people that might not otherwise come. You know what? Could you give me a bottle of water? And uh, appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> okay, that's the last one for today. Maybe. So, just if you, you know, you might know a neighbor or a relative or somebody that, that wouldn't ordinarily come to church, but they'll come to a Christmas service. Would you just start getting ready for that? Christmas Eve this year is on a Sunday. And we're gonna, it's going to be short and sweet, but we want it to be meaningful as well. And if you know somebody and you can say, listen, just come with us. It'll be an hour. Uh, just like tonight, that prayer service that we're having tonight, this is important. We need to pray. And the reason uh, God had put this on our heart when uh, and Pastor Ben uh, was with me at uh, this past year's minister school, and there was this sense of growth that God was bringing. <coughs> and the question was, was this, uh, for me, the question for me was, God, is the growth... Is the growth about our people or is the growth about the church? And the answer is both. Here's the thing. You can't grow the church unless the people in it are growing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. How thirsty do you think I am? All right. That's fine. We'll just do one at a time. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, um, and the answer, the answer is both. In order for the church to grow, in order for us to be uh, an, a lighthouse in the community... I personally have to have the light of Christ in me. If within the body of Christ, we never cease to struggle with our stuff and our, and our junk and our, you know, the things we battle with. Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone has those seasons. But if, it never, if those seasons never end, if no one ever comes to a place of fruitfulness and growth and things, you know what? God has brought, the, God has brought me from, through some stuff here. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, if he never brings us to that place, then we'll always just be doing damage control. And that makes this church an ambulance. And we're not a hospital. We're a battleship. Think about that for a second. <laughs> good spot to pause. So I, I, I just want to encourage you, the prayer that we're praying tonight, <clears throat> the get together that we're having tonight to worship and to pray. Of course, we'll pray for those who might not feel well and, and this and that. But tonight's prayer meeting is very focused. We are aiming the first Sunday evening of every month at praying for the growth of the saints and for the growth of the church here and, and all over. Right, So there will, be, there will come a time where we're going to be praying for those of you who might not be baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. There's going to come a time where we're going to pray uh, for, for those of you who have not gotten solid or feel very concrete in your relationship with the Lord. We're going to pray about those things. It's not necessarily, Lord, bless Uncle, you know, Uncle Pete because he's sick or whatever. Listen, we're going to pray for those types of things. But th what we're meeting for once a month on a Sunday evening is for the growth of the saints spiritual growth and for the growth of the church that is our focus that is our purpose it'll go from six to seven we respect your time we do we don't want to waste it but here's the thing time and prayer is never wasted ever so we so will you will you just tuck it away tuck it away spend an hour with us tonight just come spend some time in worship spend some time in prayer and let's see what god does in the new year okay having said all of that it's Tis the season, like I said. It's that time of year the decorations are out. Who in here, you say, my decorations are done. They're up, I'm done. Okay. Look at those people. We hate them. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. That just means you're better organized. Who of you is saying, I'd like to be done soon? Who of you is like, no, I've given up. I'm never going to be done. It's never going to happen. Okay, thank you for that honesty. There were all millennials who raised their hand just then at the end. In the end, it was all, that's very interesting. 
<laughs> I heard something this week about millennials. I think I'm going to share it. It's probably inappropriate. Too late. I have, I have the mic. Uh, but somebody said, you know, when you have like a, a potluck or a, like a Christmas dinner that, you know, millennials can't cook yet. They haven't quite learned how to do that yet. So really, if they're married, they b basically just need to make babies and watch grandma cook. And that's, how, and that's how you learn how to be good at a potluck. And so I began to think to myself, we need to do that. We need to do potlucks and training. And it's coming. It's coming. I'm ready. You heard me say married, right? Don't anybody look at me weird. Okay, let's just make sure. So it's that time, lights, decorations, and it's a sweet time. It's a time where there's that sensitivity that it's a little more heightened than normal. And, uh, and so there's cookies baking and, and presents being wrapped. And, and the truth is, most of the world is celebrating too. They are. They're celebrating too. And they, they'll even throw Jesus in. They'll, they'll throw Jesus in. Yeah, he's like, he, oh yeah, we celebrate Jesus. Look, he's, he's one of the little nativity characters. He's right there. They'll throw Jesus in. They'll, they'll sing the Christmas songs. They'll sing all of the same Christmas songs we do, not understanding these are worship songs. If they thought about the words they were singing. So, but most of the world is celebrating Christ like that, right? But within the church, it ought not be that way. What Christmas looks like out there should not be what Christmas looks like in here. Amen? All right, let's move on. So, Here's our scripture for today, Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And this is the story of the Magi. You know it, I'm sure, but we're going to read it here from verse 2 to verse 12. <coughs> Give you a second to get there. Matthew 2, verses 1, actually, to 12. No, verses 2, on. After Jesus, here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, that was verse 1. I'm sorry, forgive me. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for that's what the prophet had written. But you... And this is what they had written in the Old Testament. They remembered this. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him and report to me, report to me, so that I too may go worship him. Now I want you to picture an oily mustache. Like, and him going, so that I too may worship him. You know, Herod, he doesn't want, he wants to kill Jesus. He doesn't want to worship him. All right, verse 9, after they had heard the king, I always see him like that. I'm not sure why. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them. It led them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Verse 10, <clears throat> when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother married, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But you have to read into this. They're giving him stuff, but they're worshipping him. That matters. Verse 12. <clears throat> and having been warned in a dream, excuse me, in a, in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I love this story. There's a lot in here. And so we're not going to hit all of it. And forgive me for choking and coughing and sputtering. We'll get through it. You'll be fine. Um, because I know that <laughs> the words contained herein are, are good for us. The wise men may have started this whole gift thing. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk today about uh, some, some different aspects of that. That little, I don't know who would do this to me. I'm not, I'm, I'm, there's, I guarantee eventually this will fall and crash to the floor. So I'm going to put this over here. Now, when we're playing, it's going to fall anyway, but that's okay. So, here's a couple thoughts on the Magi. They were wealthy people, first of all. They were rulers. They were, wherever they were from, they were, big, they were big shots. Wherever the wise men were from, we, some people think they were kings, maybe they were princes, whatever they were, they were big shots. And here they came, right? Most likely from somewhere in Iraq. 
most likely. Not for sure. There's all kinds of guesses, but somewhere out there, right? We three kings from Orient are they're out there. I don't know what, you know where those words came from. But <coughs> the truth is they were most likely from far away regardless of where it was exactly, they were big shots and they traveled, traveled a long distance with these gifts. How many of you have ever been let down by like FedEx or UPS or the post office? How many? This week, yeah, to, like today. Anybody let down today? Like it happens all the time. Delivery services aren't, you know, is Ernie in the room, Ernie Chapin? If he is, I apologize. He works for the post. I have nothing but respect for them. He's not in the room. They stink, man. You can't trust them. No, I don't, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. L listen, I have to tell you a story. Growing up, one of the things that I prized, I just treasured in our house was my parents had bought this rotisserie oven thing. Oh, man, it works so good. Right? So Thanksgiving, you know, most people enjoy the turkey. Not me. I mean, I'll have some turkey because it's there and I'm supposed to. But the, th the, the real treasure was whatever piece of pork shoulder or a maybe prime rib if we could convince everybody to chip in or whatever like and it went in this rotisserie oven and it worked great there were a couple times where i thought maybe i should just ask her if she'll give it to me but i didn't so i tried to order one it took me ye do you remember this mom it took me years to finally get the right one i ordered one it looked great it was a good price it was online it showed up it was the size of a toaster oven it was like it was like this. I'm like, what am I going to rotisserie in there, a pigeon? It was terrible, but it didn't look that way on the picture. So then I thought, okay, all right, I have to do some more study, clearly. And I sent it back. And then I found the right one, right size, everything. And here it came, and I got home, and I was psyched, man. I saw the box on the front stoop, and I unlocked my door, and I'm all prepped. And I pick it up. Shh, shh, shh. It all the glass door was completely trashed. The whole thing. And I was like, no. It was, honestly, Steven Spielberg should have videotaped this moment because of the drama that was going on. And I was like, why, God, why? Because I was so excited to use this dumb rotisserie oven. I already had something marinating. I literally, I ordered it, and I knew when it was coming, and I had called, I had tracked this thing. I had something marinating ready to go in this thing, and the door is all shattered. It was awful. Anyhow, that has nothing to do with anything I'm about to say. Except that these were magi and they were a big deal. Actually, it's connected irrelevantly a little bit. They could have, I think, because they were big shots, sent the gifts. Could they not? Could they not have just hired some underling and said, you know what, whatever it is, Camel Overnight Express, when it absolutely has to get you know, over the Sahara or whatever, I don't know. But they could have done that, but it was important. They were big shots, but this was personal. You and that's part of it. They, were, they personally brought these things to Christ. There was an intimacy. There was a love in their action. Right? Verse 2. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. They know something's up. This is a real thing. Verse 9, 10, and 11 here. They went their way, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced. They came into the house opening the treasure. They fell down and worshipped. There's, there's, there's sincerity there. They're elated. Big shots or not, they're worshipping this kid who probably looks impoverished. I, I don't know how much money Mary and Joseph had right then. Now, after this little visit from the Magi, they're probably pretty well off. Because gold, frankincense, and myrrh, pretty valuable. So they're probably set now. The point is, it was a personal thing, and it was intimate, and it was from the heart. And the second thing was this, it was properly given. The gift was properly given. And what I mean by that, it was for the right reasons. Yes, they gave them stuff, but the stuff came with adoration. It came with genuineness. It came with love. It came with all of the emotion and the heart stuff that it should accompany a gift. How many times, how many times have you gotten a sweater? And, ah, now I've got to get him something. So you get him a sweater. Very little love involved. That's not really a gift. It's really, in fact, let's talk about that for a second. There's a couple different kinds of gifts. I know you've heard about this before. There's a gift for a gift gift, right? You know what this is. Uh, you know, I get somebody a, a mug with my face on it. Hey, Merry Christmas. I'm like, crud, how much do you think he spent on that? Five bucks? Maybe. I guess I could get him a coupon. Somebody gets you something, and now you feel obligated to determine how much it's worth and you got to go out and find something of similar value. You're smirking, all of you, because you do this. It happens every year. And, and it's worse if they give you this thing late in the season. Because now you got to run out to a store like 
and it's Christmas is upon you, and you're like, I gotta get them something. They got me a gift, I gotta get them some back. It's awful. This guilt, let it go. Can't we just let it go? Listen, you give me something at the last minute, thank you, Mazel Tov. You're not getting anything back till next year. Why do, we, why do we do this to ourselves? But that's a gift for a gift gift, right? Second part, second type of gift. And oh, oh, please, I wanna, I wanna set someone free here today. I feel the same way about Christmas cards. I feel the same way about Christmas cards. Look, I so wanna see your whole entire family that I've never met and your three dogs and your parakeet. I do. I, I want to see the I, I want to see the postcard. I want to get the letter that says, you know, Junior's in the Coast Guard now. That's great, man. I thank you for sending it. You're not getting one from me. I, I just can we just let it go, please, for the love of Pete, Andrea. Every year, Andrea's like, oh, we should send out a card to them and to them and why they see us? Can't they just look at you and say, hey, hi? Do we have to, honestly, please, can we just agree? Nobody's gonna get upset over Christmas cards. Can we do this? Like, if you wanna send them, hey, send them. We'll probably put a box out there or something if you wanna, like, put your Christmas cards. And then we'll throw them out the next week when nobody's looking. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Some of you, to some, but here's the thing. Here's the, here's the crucial thing. Here's the crucial thing. To some of you, when you send out that Christmas card, it's with all the heart in it. And there's a difference. There's a difference. That's why I don't send them out, because I don't do cards. Anyway, moving on. All right, let me move on. But same thing, gifts, cards, a gift for a gift, gift. They sent us a card, now we gotta send them a card. Just stop the madness. Now there's a second, a second type of gift. And the second type of gift is for this type of person. There's more than these, just, I'm just mentioning a couple. But the second type of gift is the type of gift that you get from someone, and they don't necessarily expect a gift back, but they'll be calling on you soon. You can bank on it, because they're gonna ask you to do something for them. Hey, I need a favor. You never did get me a Christmas present. And there are people like that, and they give you something, but it comes with strings attached. It does. I hope I'm, I, I hope I'm not describing any of you in either direction, but uh, truly, th that's, it's not, it's the, it's the kind of person that likes to keep score. It's not healthy. It's not good. It's not good, but it's the third one that I really want to talk about. See, the third one is the one that the wise men gave. And the third type of gift we're talking about is, it could be, let's call it a grace gift. It's a grace gift. It's, it's not meant to be repaid. It's, in fact, its intention is to not be repaid. I'm going to do or give, and here's the thing, it might not actually be tangible. It might not be an actual thing. It might just be some time spent or, or, or service, but it comes from your heart. That's a grace gift, and you can't pay a grace gift like that. As I said, it's not meant to be paid back. Now, obviously, we have a grace gift, the greatest one of all from God himself, in, in the baby Jesus that was born uh, so that we could do what we do, so that, so that redemption could come into this world. There's nothing you can do to repay that. There's nothing we can do to earn that. That's a grace gift, the ultimate grace gift. And when somebody gives you a gift like that, you don't soon forget it. When someone, <coughs> excuse me, when someone spends... <coughs> time with you. When, they, <clears throat> when you see that what they've given you costs them, it might be financial, it might be uh, time, it might be energy, it might be sweat, it might be all kinds of stuff. They're doing something for you. You don't forget stuff like that. And you know, and and, and you know full well they are not expecting something in return. That's a grace gift, man. Hard to forget. I hope we never forget gifts like that. A, it's impossible to measure the cost of that gift. Just very quickly, from the moment that we moved down here, there's been, and I'm not gonna mention any names because I don't wanna embarrass anyone, but there's been someone specifically who gifted us so many times, and every time, it was with words of encouragement. And it was just so uplifting, uh, truly. And there's no, there, it wasn't just the gifts, it was, it was the things that she said that came with it, that made us go, oh, that is so from the heart. I don't think, and there's no, there's no paying that back. There's no giving back enough. It's just that sweet grace gift that says, you know what? Love you. <clears throat> I love, we love you. <clears throat> and this is what God's put me here for, to bless you. Ugh. 
I, I don't need anything else. I don't need anything else. No matter what I do, I won't actually ever pay back a grace gift. That's kind of how it works. Some of you may have, sitting in your house right now, like a little, it might be a candy dish or like a little vase, and it is the ugliest, it's uglier than sin. It's awful, it's just disgusting. It's the wrong color, it's painted like a mottled brown, but it's junior or somebody made it for you, or a grandchild or one of your kids brought home this project, and, and here it is, right? And those gifts, usually, we usually keep those for a while because you're given with such joy and such sincerity from a little kid and you realize, now don't get me wrong, I understand, I'm, I'm a parent too, so inadvertently sometimes those things accidentally hit the floor and they break and you got to get rid of them, you know, but there's a sweet genuineness in there. Come on, listen, Andrea and I, I just kind of thrown her under the, under the bus here, we, there was this, there was this owl this thing was so gross. I don't even know where it came from. Was it Julian's? It was. I love you, buddy. I love you, buddy. Listen, he doesn't even remember it. Anyway, he's like me. His, his, uh, his, uh, his sensitivities lie elsewhere. <laughs> Anyhow, so finally, it was in this pot of dirt. Like, I don't know why it was in the pot of dirt, but the clay got wet. Like, it was gross. It was horrible. But it was in this, we moved it from house to house that we lived in. This owl came with us. Finally, the other day, she's like, you know what? I think I'm just going to throw it out. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, throw it out. Throw it out immediately. I am not a saver. I'm not a hoarder. Now, it's okay to be a saver if you're going to remember where that thing is and use it again, right? Otherwise, you're a hoarder, right? TV cameras are coming for your house. Like many of you are like, oh, no, no, this is valuable. Only if you remember it. <laughs> Only if you're going to use it before Jesus comes back. Otherwise, it's got no value. All right, now I'm getting people angry at me. I'm going to get emails. All right. So a grace gift you cannot pay back. And maybe instead of, here's the thing, maybe instead of running to the mall for someone, you start thinking, what grace gift could I give them? Could I, could I take them for a cup of tea or coffee or whatever and just spend some time with them? Or maybe, maybe it's just write out a prayer in a, in, in, on, on, a, on a card or in a book or something and give them that. And it's, it's, it's heartfelt. It's sincere. It's a grace gift. It's meant to do something more. Some of you, if you're able, you know, you can call somebody who's not able and say, hey, can I fix something for you? Let me, let me do this for you. I, can, I have these skills. Let me do that. That's a grace gift. You don't have to pay me back. I have stuff I can do for you. Let me do that. I just want to bless you. That's a grace gift. Oftentimes, they're not material, as I said. And truly, it, it, it's so easy to just jump on Amazon. And, and we forget that that's really, that's, really not, uh, that's really not what we were meant to do. It's not meant to be that commercial, weird, go into debt time of year. And I want, to be gen I want to be genteel about this. Honest to goodness, there are so many people that go into ridiculous debt at Christmas. Well, because you want it to be special. Make it special another way. Don't be so shallow. Stuff does not make it special. Do I like a Christmas tree? Sure. I like a Christmas tree. I like gifts. I like stuff as much as the next guy. I do. But you know what? If there comes a time where you're killing yourself to rework your budget so that you can get everything in there, man, I, I see people, I see people give themselves whew, aneurysms over this stuff. It's not worth it. Find out who those people are that mean the most to you that you want to do for, and then think up what grace gift would be best for them. Maybe they'd rather have you make a meal for them and spend time with you rather than get them a, I don't know, whatever, $80 something or $50 something. Maybe that would be more valuable. Maybe it's a service gift. Maybe it's, maybe it's that. I, in North Jersey, in North Jersey, I had about three, at least three brothers in the church who would do anything for me. And I mean anything. Now, I've been, I was there a while. I was there many years. But these three guys would, I mean, they would bend over. They'd show up at the church, Pastor, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Oh, there were three of them, three brothers in the church. They were, they were wonderful, they, these three guys. Now, granted, one of them said to me one day, and I'm not exaggerating, and you'll know who I'm, I mean as soon as I say it. Pastor, I'd do anything for Jesus, and I'd do anything for you. And if you need me to whack someone and go to jail for you, I would do it. I was like, oh, what a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. As soon as I have somebody that needs whacking, I'll, I'll call you. Uh, 
you know, but he was, he was so utterly sincere, it made me nervous. I actually said, just for clarity's sake, there's no one. There's no, even if you see me ha having an argument with a board member in the lobby, don't whack anyone. There's no, I, it's don't, just let it go. But these three guys, literally, th all they wanted to do was serve. I mean that. I mean, they, they just had, they had this thing, anything at all. They would, walk, they would walk five miles uphill both ways with no shoes in the snow, right, all that, to get to me if it was to help me with a car problem because my car wouldn't start. They would do anything. Anyway, moving, moving on. Those guys were such a, a blessing to me. And you know what makes me sad? What makes me sad is I don't know that I appreciated them as much as I do now that I haven't seen them in three years. Isn't that interesting? and sad and it made me sort of think about myself and say you know what this is here I was getting these very much grace gifts from these guys and it wasn't financial because none of them were well off but they were just servants they were amazingly just committed to blessing the church and the Lord but me too personally whatever we can do and it was amazing and that was so much more valuable than somebody who would pop in with a hey here's a gift card to whatever it was more, it was so much more valuable than that. I can't even explain it, right? So maybe, maybe we think about that. You know, maybe it's about uh, baking cookies, but let it come with words of encouragement. Maybe it's about doing something and, and all of that. Simply love and accept it. So now that the intro is done, here's my sermon. Five things about giving, real quick. That's not funny. What? I'm, I'm done with my intro. Number one. Number one. Give an unexpected gift to someone. Give an unexpected gift to someone. Here's the thing. No one expected the Magi to show up. They, they didn't expect the Magi to show up. They're not even Jewish. They were Jews. They were from the middle of nowhere out there. Nobody knew who these guys were. They were big shots in their own land, but they weren't Jewish. And it was unexpected. But they'd been studying the skies. The Bible says they had been studying the skies, the movement of the stars, and they realized, wait a minute, this is real. Something about this is real. Now, this can get a little funny, and I have to talk about it a little bit. Before you say, isn't astrology a cult? Yes, it is. It is. But first of all, remember this. These guys aren't Jewish yet. They don't know Jesus. Nobody does yet. He's just been born, right? They're not Jewish. They don't know the Old Testament laws. They have no idea what's been written about uh, getting involved in witchcraft and that sort of thing. They are who they are. And they're studying the skies. And here's an important thing to note. Where did it lead them? To worship Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Right? Let me read Psalm 19 real quick. Just in case you're wondering, yeah, but how can that be? This is what they saw. These wise men, these magi, these whatever they were, this is what they saw. Psalm 19 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God. And they saw it. The skies proclaim the what? The work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Do you understand how complicated God's design is? We, we have so little understanding of how massive the picture really is. And how God designed everything to mesh. And the very stars align in a certain way to tell the story of history playing out. That's amazing. That should give you goosebumps. That's amazing. And these guys are looking up. And verse 3, verse 3, we're still talking about the skies. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Talk about power. And here are these magi. And they look up and they say, this is real. This is the real thing. And they follow it to where the Christ child is. Whew. Side note, please, this is important. Please don't think this makes horoscopes and all that other garbage okay. It does not. Let me be clear. Let me say it again. Horoscopes, astrology, all of that. That is sorcery. It's not good. And scripture talks about it. It's a cult. It's demonic. It's not healthy. Well, pastor, didn't you say that? Didn't you say that we'll learn truth if we do that? No, we live in a different day. Listen to me. You now have the word of God and you also have the living power.
powerful Holy Spirit to indwell the heart that you prepared a place for him in. You don't need to look up into the stars. Now, if you read the word and in conjunction with reading the word and in prayer, look up at the stars and study. You guys ever heard of Lou Giglio? He's a fantastic teacher and an expositor of things like creation and, and all of that. He's just really great. He does a great job of reading the word of God and then looking into science and showing how well it meshes. And it does. But it starts with the word. It doesn't start with a telescope. It can end with a telescope, but it's got to start with the word. Okay, let me move on. One more tiny item. If you're wondering to yourself, well, in doing this, in studying the skies, did they please God? Well, it pleased God enough that a star led them. It pleased God enough that he talked to them in their dream, said, don't go that way, go the other way. It pleased God enough that he was speaking to them. And I think he was honored by their worship of Jesus. Don't you? Yeah, I think so. So number one, give unexpected grace gifts. It wasn't expected, but they did it anyway. Number two, the second thing that we look, kind of look at uh, about the wise men is how happy they were, how joyful they were to give it. They rejoiced. They were, they were exceedingly happy with genuine joy. They, they rejoiced when they saw the star. They rejoiced when they saw Mary and Jesus, right? They traveled a long way. I can't imagine they're not tired. Even, listen, their reaction is joy, and it's not joy at having given a physical thing. I think it was the joy of giving the worship and of bowing and of being able to say, wow, this is it. This is what we know is the real thing. This is the Messiah. And in honoring him and worshiping him, they were overjoyed. The poorest person can still give a grace gift and rejoice over it. In fact, we should. The very act of letting go of, of money or time, when you give this act of, when you give this gift of grace, the very act of letting go of whatever it might be that you've got to give, and you do it with joy, it, it kind of, it makes something click in your heart. It should feel good to give. In the same way that the Bible says that when we give in the offering or in tithing, we give to the Lord out of what? A cheerful heart. It's the same thing when you give a gift to someone. Otherwise, don't give it. Don't, it's not worth it. Don't give it at all, right? So they gave with real joy. Number three, their gift was personal, but we already covered that. Their gift was intentional. It came with love. That was number three, and we covered it. Number four, I would encourage you to give a gift that will last. And to give a gift that will last, you have to think it through. It comes with prayer. It comes with love. It comes with thought. It comes with sincerity and, and genuineness. It might be a physical thing. There might be a physical need, but it might be an emotional need. It might be a spiritual need. It might be time spent together. It might be knitting together a relationship. You say, Pastor, I don't have time. That's what a grace gift is. It costs you something. It does cost you something. And those are gifts that will last. Listen, 2,000 years ago, these magi came from out of nowhere and gave these gifts. We're still talking about it today. Talk about a gift that lasted. I don't think it's about the frankincense, gold, and the myrrh that we're still talking about it today. I think it's the fact that these guys came from nowhere and worshipped him. And that's a picture, by the way. That's a picture of how God was already setting up redemption for the entire Gentile world. Just those first magi that were there. It's real. It's, it, give a gift that will last. Let me say one more thing about giving before I wrap this up. The last thing I would say about gifts is give the gift now. Give the gift now. Don't hesitate. Don't stall. <clears throat> Pastor, I hear what you're saying. Good idea. I'm going to do this. As soon as I have some time. Maybe next year we've got <coughs> things more together. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Um, maybe next year when we have things a little bit more together, we'll, we'll be able to get something or do something. Don't wait. Don't wait. Because you don't know how much time we have. And I don't mean that. I, I'm not saying that to be morbid. I believe that we need to give it right now. I want to read you something. It's author unknown. It's author unknown. <clears throat> so just listen to it for a second. It's a bit of a poem, I guess, written by somebody who's not listed. Here it is. They were going to be all that they wanted to be tomorrow. None would be braver or kinder than they tomorrow. A friend who was troubled and wearied they knew would be glad for a lift, and he needed it too. And on him they would call and see what they could do. But tomorrow. Each morning they stacked up the letters they'd write. Tomorrow. And thought of the folks that they would fill with delight. Tomorrow. The greatest of people they just might have been. The world would have opened its heart up to them. But in fact, they passed on and faded from view. And all that they left when their living was through was a mountain of things that they intended to do. Tomorrow. Excuse me. 
there's not a doubt in my mind that everyone in here has someone that you know that has wronged you or you've wronged or an annoyed you in some way or that you've annoyed in some way and that you think to yourself about them occasionally to say, I should call them. I should send them a little note. I should apologize, even if it's not my fault. Or maybe it's not a negative, but maybe it's just someone that you know, you know what, I've been meaning to encourage that lady, that sister, that brother, that elderly person that lives down the street. I've been meaning to do that. I have a couple people in my world that if I talk to them, I have to make sure I've got two hours to do it. Because I know that once they start, I'm stuck. And I will literally have to walk off while they're talking. But I keep a few of those. Actually, I made some new ones. <laughs> Live across the street from my mother. <laughs> anyway. And he's a sweet guy, but he want, they people, there are people, they need you. They need someone. And so, and so I know I know that in this room alone, there's opportunity for us to give grace gifts all over our communities. Kindnesses, service, maybe tangible gifts if, you, if, you're, if you're able, all of that, right? I know that if, if the people of God would, would act like the people of God, we would, we, would bless, we would bless the socks off people. And then we would buy them more socks so we could do it again. Listen, this is Christmas, and we're going to talk next week about, you know, today was a gift worth, worth giving, and uh, next week it's a gift, what's next week? Next week is a gift worth waiting for. And the truth is, we have been given the greatest gift of all. And for us to have this gift of grace, of mercy, of Christ, of salvation, we really, we really don't have the right, we really don't have the right to say, I'm too busy. I, I, I'm, I, don't have, I don't have enough time for this. Uh, you know, what you're talking about, it, I'm going to have to call them, and, and, and then she's going to want this, or then, you know. Listen, it, it's worth it, because we've been given truly the greatest gift, and we ought to be using it. I want to close with this verse. I want to close with this verse. And I'm going to ask you before I do that. Today, just... Write a note when you get home. You know, I've done this. I do this time to time. I've done it before. Today, when you get home, write a note. Maybe put it in your Bible of someone you know you need to call or someone you know you need to send a postcard to or a letter or something like that. Or maybe it's, you know, go hug a relative that doesn't expect it or something like that. Everyone has, everyone has that in our life. Everyone has those types of people in our lives that we know we could really lift them up today. We could really encourage them. We would make, you would make someone's whole day by sending them a text or a phone call or a, or a card saying, I'm thinking about you. I appreciate you. Something. You know them. And, I, and I'm just asking that, that we would tuck that away and do that. Can we, can we do that? Think of someone that you could encourage, that you could lift up that way. And, and here's the thing. We are able to give gifts like that. We are able to give grace gifts because of what we've received. And I'll close with this verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. So praise be to the, God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. I think that last time is near, if not upon us. And it's coming. We're either going to be real, we're either going to be real or we're not. I'm not saying we're going to be flawless here, folks. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We're not going to be without issue, without, without problems. We're not gonna, but I think that if we're going to be real, we need to start now. Because salvation is upon us. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, 
may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Talk about Christmas. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And, he, and, even, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Would you stand with me as we close?